When we talk about childhood PTSD here, we're always referencing a difficult dynamic that is usually delivered by parents and stuck onto children. And it's the children who write to me about what happened with their parents and the struggles they're having right now. But sometimes the source of the problem goes beyond that parent-child relationship and it's between the siblings. And there's an abusive dynamic, sometimes an emotional abuse that continues into adulthood. And that can be so confusing because the ties of family are so strong that it makes it hard to decide to check out from a relationship that's going really badly. It's not uncommon at all that in a family where kids are neglected, where their needs aren't met, where there's a lot of trouble, violence, fighting, that children will turn on each other too. My letter today is from a woman I'll call Linda. And she's in this kind of situation. She writes, Dear Fairy, I've so been enjoying your channel. Of course, I also had a difficult childhood. When I left the house at 18, I was fortunate to fall in with a great crowd of people. My tribe of people had good therapy and shared with me important information that helped me slowly work my way out of being reactive and learning to trust again. I was very fortunate. I made it through college, graduate school, met a wonderful man who I married, and I've been very happy with that for the last 25 years. Got the fairy pencil. I'm circling a couple of things that Linda said that I want to come back to to see if I can help. So she writes, my brother started drinking in his 20s. I love him very much, but I've tolerated a lot of really bad behavior. I could go on and on, but in short, it's emotional abuse that he grew up with and thinks it's normal. He also talks bad about me behind my back to have others not like me as it's highly triggering for him that people like me better. I have always tried to share with him the stuff that I've learned that helped me to move on to a better place. He never wanted to hear it and always shut me down. He resents me for my success and for my happiness. His narrative is that our upbringing was only hard for him. When I left home at 18, he felt that I abandoned him. As the years went on, at some point I just decided to gray rock. Gray rock is when you don't give somebody uh, emotional reactions. It tends to help prevent them from getting into a big fighting dynamic with you. I just decided to go gray rock, sidestep any difficult conversation, agree with any idea he had, and go to bed early to avoid any drunken weirdness. So he thought probably our relationship was fine because he wasn't aware of all the work I was doing to avoid triggering him at all costs. I didn't spend much time in his presence because it didn't feel very good to me. We are both now in our 50s and during the pandemic we talked more on the phone. He talked about how he was having a lot of personal growth, which of course I was so happy about and I believed him. A friend of mine started being interested in my brother. It was mutual. They asked how I felt about it and I gave my blessing. I did, however, give warnings to both of them. For my brother, I warned him that what he didn't like about me, he might also find he wouldn't like about her. For her, I warned her that he had a Madonna whore complex. During the course of their relationship, it became clear that he did not have enough personal growth to be able to handle this relationship. He basically engaged in a lot of behaviors that were reminiscent of the childhood abuse that we suffered. It was hard to watch my friend be subjected to this. They are now broken up. Around the time that they were getting together, my brother said he wanted to be closer to me. I felt very touched and started to do the work to make that happen. I needed him to understand that his behavior toward me was reminiscent of our childhood abuse and that changes would have to be made. But first, he would have to see that he was not always good to me and that I had to let abuse roll off my back, which in a healthy relationship is not a thing. I wanted to talk to him about his fondness for, and she puts a name here, but it's a podcaster who has a reputation for teaching men how to have relationships with women in a controlling way way to get, you know, to have control over the relationship. Um, and I wanted to talk to him about how growing up in a misogynistic household was difficult for me and to be subjected to it through him as a young adult was hard for me. He got really angry. He accused me of bringing up ancient history. He felt I was being disloyal because I called him out on his behavior. I feel he may have CPTSD or narcissistic personality disorder or perhaps borderline 
I don't really know. I just know that he has a really sweet side and a really mean side. He cares a lot about how others see him. The biggest sin is to make him look bad. I do know that he does not have a lot of empathy toward me. He tells stories and changes facts to align with the victim narrative. He loves sympathy. I know that he has never had any interest in knowing me deeply. I know that I have not told him much about my life because I didn't care for the ridicule which would go on for years. <laughs> My husband feels that I would not tolerate this in any other relationship. At some point during the relationship with my friend, my brother wrote me a letter accusing me of trying to break them up. He basically informed me that he was maturely walking away from our relationship. It hurt, but I also felt pretty stupid for all the years that I spent limping the relationship along and the years that I kept trying to help him understand how his behavior was ruining his life. We have been no contact since he's written me that letter. A friend suggested I go to Al-Anon. I feel like it's a good place for me. I'm totally getting that I can't help him as he drinks every day, and this is probably part of the problem in addition to the childhood trauma. Now that he's broken up with my friend, he's reaching out in an emotional way. In the past, I've always been a shoulder for him to cry on. I would always say things like, I'm so sorry, you're so misunderstood. In the past, I did believe stories he told me. But now I just don't have it in me to open up to him. I struggle with this. I've evolved into a very open-hearted person. I feel very securely attached to my people. I've been able to work out a lot of issues with my important people. I vacillate between knowing it's the right thing to stay, no contact with my brother, to feeling guilty for leaving him behind. I know he doesn't want to hear what I really have to say. I feel like he's trying to tell me what he thinks I want to hear so that he can just gather information on his ex. He's very obsessed with her and also engaged in conspiracy theories regarding her after the breakup. Basically, he started telling people she was a Tinder swindler. Sigh, says Linda. So feel free to go all fairy on me. <laughs> go all fairy. <laughs> yeah, I love your insights. I clearly have a blind spot regarding my brother. Thank you. Linda. All right. All right, Linda. For one thing, I relate to your story so much, and I had a brother who was kind of similar. And since you're going into Al-Anon, and I learned to deal with this stuff by going into Al-Anon 28 years ago, I feel like this is sort of like an old timer talking to a newcomer, and I think I can help. Okay, so I'm just going to go over some of the highlights of your letter, letter here. You had a difficult childhood. Um, you left the house and you got in with a great group of people and you mentioned in several ways that you're grateful for that, that they helped you get perspective and to not be so reactive and to learn to trust again. And that's really great. You know, I seldom hear people say that. That's, a, that's an incredible accomplishment. Your brother started drinking in his 20s and you love him very much, but you've tolerated a lot of really bad behavior, which is just what happens with people who drink. You say you could go on and on, but in short, it's emotional abuse that he grew up with and he thinks is normal. And he, he talks bad about you behind your back and he wants others not to like you. And it's very triggering for him that other people like you better. I'm circling that. I'm just questioning a little bit. Um, it's, you didn't give details on that. So for your own reference, you know, check that assumption. Is that really true or is that something that you fear is the case? You could be right. I don't know. But it also sounds like the kind of thing that I would have feared about my brother. And I think in the end I had perspective that he wasn't really that intentional about everything. He was just self-centered. Okay. Who knows if our brothers are similar. All right. I've always tried to share with him the stuff that I've learned that helped me move on to a better place. So... <laughs> You know, me too. I did that with my brother and, oh, I wanted him to get sober so bad. He was, he was an alcoholic and also a heroin addict. And I got into Al-Anon recovery about six months before he died and he died suddenly. I didn't know that was coming. Our mother had just died um, to do with cancer and complications of alcoholism. And we had had this incredibly good talk and I told him, I'm in Al-Anon, it's so great. I've got a sponsor, I'm working the steps. You should totally do this. And I wanted to share with him what I had found. For me, it answered so much about why our life was difficult and why things were so hard to discuss and get to any kind of truth about. It explained so much. And I told him about it, and I can just say that luckily he was happy for me that I found something, but he didn't find it for himself. 
and your brother never wanted to hear it and he always shut you down. And I will tell you, <laughs> that is to be expected, especially if somebody's drinking and especially if it's still working for them. When somebody becomes alcoholic, and you describe later here what sounds like alcoholism, so, you know, obviously we can't diagnose other people, but I'm just taking your word for it. Um, that he's an alcoholic. And I know alcoholics like the back of my hand. My family was full of them. And um, yeah, when you talk about healing or you actually take a step up in your life, it can be very disruptive to the family dynamic and you get put down or you get shut down. I know that, so I believe you. So he resents you for your success and for your happiness. Okay, I believe you. His narrative is that our upbringing was only hard for him. Mm -hmm. And what you're describing is kind of similar to the dynamic I had with my brother. And well, it's curious because um, not that he died when we were in our 30s and it was, gosh, almost 30 years ago. But he left behind some papers that I kept and I guess I hadn't gone through all of them. So when I did look in the folder, I saw that my brother had actually been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. And it was very weird to see. It was validating on one hand, but it also seemed like it kind of minimized how bad the problem is. So maybe one day you'll have more insight into what's going on with your brother, but I just had to share that because I relate. But that was it. He thought that he was the only person for whom the family life was hard. And I remember once he said to me, and I said, well, you know, I have a lot of problems. And he said, you have problems? You don't have problems. Everything's perfect for you. And that's very funny that he thought that. <laughs> Not true at all, but that I was fairly, um, I put on a happy face, I was the functional one, and I didn't attract a lot of attention when I needed help, and so I didn't get help. So it sounds like you may have a similar dynamic to that as well. When you left home at 18, he felt that you abandoned him. As the years went on, at some point, you just decided to gray rock him and sidestep any difficult conversation, agree with any ideas he had, and go to bed early to avoid any drunken weirdness. So I totally get that survival strategy, but not only is it gray rock, it's kind of like stonewalling. So at a certain point, you decided not to have any kind of a authentic relationship with him. And again, I totally don't blame you. I know how hard it is to be in that kind of dynamic. You were protecting yourself, but a little bit, I would just say, you know, I want to call to your attention how you were part of the decision to make the relationships empty and um, lack, lack the sort of closeness that you would need to give somebody constructive criticism. So when you have that kind of empty relationship and you criticize, it just comes off as criticism. And I think that might explain why the, you get these bad reactions. Because you never showed him and you just went to bed and you got out of the way, he probably thought your relationship was fine because he wasn't aware of all the work you were doing to avoid triggering him at all costs. Yep. I didn't spend much time in his presence because it didn't feel very good for me. Okay. Now you're in your 50s and during the pandemic you talked more on the phone. And that's really sweet, you know, this closeness. You tried again. He talked about how he was having a lot of personal growth. And I... I can imagine that must have been so exciting to hear. You were so happy. You believed him. Then your friend starts dating him. And they both felt that way, have felt, you know, romantically drawn to each other. They asked how you felt. Very classy of them. I like that. And you gave your blessing. That's kind. You say, I did, however, give warnings to both of them. For my brother, I warned him that what he didn't like about me, he might also find he wouldn't like about her. Okay, fair enough. But here's something. You said, for her, I warned her that he had a Madonna whore complex. So, Linda, he might have that. But I would just like to point out, you can't simultaneously say that about somebody and give a blessing. That there's some kind of disconnect you're doing there where you're playing the role of somebody who's giving a blessing and being supportive and then saying something that's like a, a stab in the back. Now, he may have that complex, but to say that to the woman he loves and they're serious enough about each other to ask you, it's, um, I would say there's no way that could be interpreted as uh, anything but trying to dissuade her from being with him. So it seems a little bit backhanded. And I say that while totally understanding you could be right and you could have been concerned about your friend and you were put in a position of being asked how you felt. And I know that's hard, but you wanted me to go all fairy. And I think that there's this passive aggressive thing in you going on and it's pretty aggressive. 
saying he has a Madonna whore complex. Like, no woman should get together with a guy who has that, right? Right? Okay. So during the course of their relationship, it became clear that he didn't have enough personal growth to be able to handle this relationship. He basically engaged in a lot of behaviors that were reminiscent of the childhood abuse that we suffered. And you don't specify, so I can't really comment on that. It was hard to watch my friend be subjected to this. They are now broken up. Around the time that they were getting together, my brother said he wanted to be closer to me. I felt very touched, and I started to do the work to make that happen. <laughs> yeah. I, I know, hope springs eternal, right? I needed him to understand that his behavior toward me was reminiscent of our childhood abuse and that changes would have to be made. Okay, here again. So Linda, I'm going all fairy. Like, I just have so much sympathy dealing with an alcoholic who's emotionally abusive. You know, I could just give him a total pass and say everything you did was perfect, but I know you're asking me about this because you feel guilty. You suspect there's some role you played in this. So I'm, I'm gonna try to help you find it. And this is one of the things. I needed him to understand that his behavior toward me was reminiscent of childhood abuse. So you actually, I would just say, you don't actually need anybody to understand anything. If you wanna have a good relationship with people, sometimes you have to accept where they are because they don't agree with you about something. They're not gonna come over to your side. You can leave the relationship if you don't like that, but if you're gonna be with them, all relationships they can't be that conditional. I mean, you can, you can set the condition, but if you set that condition and right then he couldn't deal with it, I don't know, it was time, it wasn't a boundary, you know, it wasn't a boundary that you respected. Um, I think it was a, it was a wish. Sometimes what we think are boundaries are wishful thinking. Okay, so I needed him to understand that he had to make changes. And first he would have to see that his, that he was not always good to me and that I had let abuse roll off my back which in a healthy relationship is not a thing. And you're right, having to be abused at all and just like tolerate it is not part of a healthy relationship. So you wanted to say, I will have you in my life, um, but we gotta talk about some stuff. The way you're talking about it, it also has this kind of dual quality of like, yeah, I'm doing the work to get ready for this, but the work that you're describing isn't on your side. It's about trying to change him. And I can just attest to the futility of trying to get, make somebody understand something like that and make somebody change. It's futile. In rare cases, if they really want a relationship with you, they might acquiesce to your demands. But the way you describe it yourself, it does sound like a demand and it doesn't really sound like an open heart. I, I get you that you, you, know, you say later that you, your life has become open hearted, but you're trying to put up these boundaries. And maybe because of the way you grew up, you're not really describing boundaries, you're describing criticism. Okay, just to put a fine point on it. All right, I wanted to talk about his fondness for a podcaster. So I don't know this podcaster, but I just looked up the name you gave me. And it's, I guess this person is controversial because it's like, you can, you can trick women into liking you and own them and have your power, you know? So it's distasteful to me too, but if you thought that you got to tell him not to like that, there it goes again. You don't get to do that. You don't have to like it, but he gets to like it. And he doesn't have to change what he likes for you, nor could he if he tried. And you, you wanted to talk about how growing up in a misogynistic household was difficult for you, for me, you say, and um, to be subjected th to it through your brother as an adult was really hard. So I get it. I get that you wanted to talk about that, but still like making it a condition for having him in your life. It just sounds, it sounds like a doomed project that you are imagining what he would be like if he were like you and had the same values and had the same level of sobriety and wanted the same things and really didn't like who he had been. But I'm not hearing that he felt that way. You did. I'm hearing a lot that you don't like him. And this is just, you know, I, I know how it's possible to love somebody but not like them, but you don't like or respect him. And you wanted him to understand that. And he got really angry when you said that and accused you of bringing up ancient history, which may have been like if he's still, if he's not into that podcaster anymore, then it is ancient history. And I know for me, I, I have people who have been in my life a long time who bring up ancient history and they're like, I, I had one friend say, you know, but you're always in these chaotic situations. And I was like, uh, yeah, up until, you know, 18 years ago, but then, you know, so. 
sometimes, especially with family members, it can be hard to be seen for who you are now. So that's possible. I, I, I can't really say. Sounds like there's enough problems that I could be wrong, but, but he thought it was ancient history. It's not how he was, not what he was into now. So he felt like you were being disloyal because I called him out on his behavior. So maybe there's a little bit here where I see some language that you are using here that is common language on uh, YouTube channels and websites that are all about diagnosing other people with narcissism. So that is like one of the bullet points. They think you're disloyal if you call them out on your behavior. I, so I'm just question, you know, going all fairy, like, is that really true? Is that really what he felt or is that what you, what your assessment is? And if you only have your own assessment and he hasn't told you something, I would encourage you to like get back, get very open-minded. You can ask him how he felt about it and listen to that and take him at face value. You can override it in the end and go, I just don't like how this is going. I don't believe him. You can do that. But that sounds a little bit like a projection of somebody who wants to see narcissistic personality disorder. So um, then you say, I feel he may have CPTSD or narcissistic personality disorder or maybe borderline. Well, that's a pretty wide swath there of things. You know something's wrong. You say, I don't really know. I just know he was, has a really sweet side and a really mean side. So one other possibility, you could be right about any of those things, but a really sweet side and a really mean side goes with alcoholism as well. It could be just that. Or an alcoholic who had a traumatic childhood, sure. The sweet side and the mean side, in fact, shows up in people who just have CPTSD. And I was just supporting somebody today and coaching them through that. Wonderful person, keeps flying into rages and pushing friends away, right? So that could be a CPTSD thing. And it is hard to deal with and nobody has to put up with it. Nobody's obliged to stay connected to somebody who's behaving in that emotionally abusive manner. But anyway, the diagnosis, I would take the emphasis off the diagnosis. I don't know, sometimes helpful, you know, to look at what are the signs and go, yeah, yeah, that's it. Sometimes it can just help kind of release the confusion to have a little bit of a, a pattern to hang all that chaos on and, and know what happened. He cares a lot about how others see him. Um, the biggest sin is to make him look bad. So uh, that does, it sounds like your assessment, but okay, you know, you are a sister, you know a thing or two. I do know that he does not have a lot of empathy towards me. He tells stories and changes facts to align them with his victim narrative. He loves sympathy. I know that he has never had any interest in knowing me deeply. I know that I have not told him much about my life because I don't care for the ridicule which would go on for years. My husband feels that I would not tolerate this in any other relationship. I hear you about your husband, and that is significant. The other stuff, it sounds like you're, you're reciting bullet points from descriptions of a narcissist. I'm not saying you're wrong to do that, but if you're looking to try to understand, like, I don't think you would feel guilty if you didn't think that somehow you were being unfair to him. So I'm, I'm searching for where you might have been unfair to him. And it, these sound like bullet points. It's not 100% verified in this letter anyway, that those are more than bullet points. And you're going, yeah, yeah, he has that. It's not necessarily what he said he felt. All right. At some point during the relationship with my friend, he wrote me a letter accusing me of trying to break them up. I think the Madonna whore comment counts as trying to break them up. So I'm going to give him one point there of I believe him. That's what it sounds like. He basically informed me that he, has mature, that he was maturely walking away from our relationship. It hurt, but I also felt pretty stupid for all the years that I spent limping the relationship along. So he, I know he later came back and wanted emotional support when the relationship was over. And that does sound, it sounds like somebody with CPTSD. It sounds like somebody with abandonment wounds. Alcoholism would definitely compound it with or without some, you know, personality disorder there. <clears throat> but if you were saying things like that about him, I could see that he thought that maybe the healthy thing was for him to step back from you. And you say then you felt stupid that you kept trying to help him understand how his behavior was ruining his life. So that's a criticism. That's not help. Helping him understand how his behavior was ruining his life. This is a very Al-Anon thing. I'm really going to get to Al-Anon. You're about to say that too. Helping somebody understand how their behavior is ruining their life is not technically your job. It's a criticism and nobody likes criticism even when they're in the middle of making these mistakes that are easy to see from the outside. So this is, this would be a way, and this is all fairy again. I, <laughs> I have to keep qualifying this. I have sympathy for you. I get it. This sounds hard, 
but if I look for your part, you're coming off like you really think you're better than him. And I think you have your life more together and you have, you're trying to hold a boundary against somebody whose life is kind of messy and who's not very considerate towards you. And you have a dynamic where, where he takes and takes and you give and give. But what that's called is like codependence. And I would encourage you in that bit that you're having codependent traits show up is if you want to heal from it, don't blame him for making you act that way. Don't blame him for making you act that way. Just go ahead and own, I'm acting that way. I'm responding to somebody's life chaos by trying to make them understand and trying to make them hear me that their mistakes are hurting them and you know, trying to fix them. So that trying to fix other people, it's a natural urge. It feels like it's coming from a well-intentioned place, but really where it's coming from is when we have a vision of how somebody should be in our mind and then comparing them to that ideal that we have for them and finding them lacking and criticizing them for it. He may not be the ideal that you have in mind. He is who he is. And your peace and happiness with him, if you decide to have him in your life, is going to be from completely letting go of not, you just don't change him. Don't, don't hold an ideal that's different than what he is. See if you can open your eyes to who he is and decide for yourself, is that okay with you? Can you be around that? Can you not uh, make him indebted to you by trying to fix him or make him understand anything or be a role model for him or anything? Because you don't have to. He's not asking you to. It sounds like he is asking for emotional support. And I don't think that's a crime, you know, but I totally understand if you are just tapped out and you don't want to give it to him anymore. So a friend suggested that I go to Al-Anon. You say, I feel like it's a good place. And you didn't say here if you'd been there yet or you just read something, but I hope you went. I think it is a good place. It's so good. What you're describing here is so much what an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic and a family go through. It's, it's really normal. You're not crazy. You're not the only person who ever sort of like slipped into this weird dynamic of like trying to help somebody be better, but having it end up feeling kind of controlling and having it alienate them. I've been there myself with more than one person in my life and it's so painful and fruitless. So Al-Anon is brilliant. It's like, um, I don't know, it's like a philosophical jujitsu that helps you see how you can be completely effective as yourself by releasing the need to try to make other people be a certain way. And oddly enough, it opens the door often to more, more closeness and more intimacy. Sometimes what you discover when you actually start owning your own motives and feelings is that you just don't want the person in your life. And that's okay too. You get to have no contact if you decide to, but I know you're feeling guilty. I think that most people who go no contact with relatives who ultimately feel good about that decision also feel guilty. So it's not really an answer for you that you feel guilty, but uh, it's, it's worth exploring and looking at. So now he's broken up with your friend. He drinks every day. You think that's probably part of the problem. Yeah, I think so too. And you used to be a shoulder to cry on and you used to say, I'm sorry, you're so misunderstood. And that, if you think that it's his behavior doing it, then saying he's misunderstood is enabling, and you get to learn about that in Al-Anon, and just kind of get some tools to sort of release that urge. I totally understand how you want to do that. You want to comfort the person. But you say now, you just don't have it in you to open up to him, to believe his stories anymore, and you struggle with this. I've evolved into a very open-hearted person. I feel very securely attached to my people. Lovely. I've been able to work out a lot of issues with my important people. I vacillate between knowing it's the right thing to stay no contact to feeling guilty for leaving him behind. And so I really understand that family ties are so strong. It feels so wrong to walk away. And yet, if you have a family member who every time they come into your life, it introduces a bunch of drama and upset and kind of pulls you back from the good place you're going, it is a legitimate possibility to look at that you would want to stay no contact. So I'm going to suggest to you, because you're not 100% clear, that you let it be no contact for now, just for now. And you know, you'll figure out more as you go. Going to Al-Anon, it could be completely healing towards whatever it is that makes it hard for you to set boundaries and be yourself around him. And even if he doesn't ask you who you are, you can stop like waiting for him to be interested in who you are or caring about what you're going through. And you can just see him for what he is. 
most of the alcoholics in my family have died. And the one thing that that assists for me is that there's definitely no hope that they're ever going to come around and like get it about what they did and what I didn't get from them. And it's helped me to then see them for what they are and feel love anyway. And I sometimes have a fantasy that I could go back in time and see them while they were still alive. And if I could, I imagine anyway that what I would want to do is, is really just like release that expectation that they'd be different or care about me and really just regard them. Just go, ah, oh, there they are, that poor soul. I love them so much. And I know you love your brother. So you could just jump the queue and feel that detached love for him anyway. That's kind of one of the ideas of Al-Anon. Detach with love. Detach with love. You don't detach with a just like, screw you, I'm not dealing with you anymore. You detach with love. So you closed off by saying, I know, I know he doesn't want to hear what I really have to say. And that's often true. My family didn't want to hear it either. And in good part, because what I was saying was really angry and trying to make them change. Not very accepting. Everybody, even when they're in the middle of big problems, they want to be accepted for who they are. You don't have to accept them, but I wouldn't just try to get in their face with the lack of acceptance. That's, it's unkind and it doesn't reflect well on you, okay? So I feel like he's trying to tell me what he thinks I want to hear so that he can just gather information on his ex. Ah, could be right. He's very obsessed with her. Mm -hmm. And also engaged in conspiracy theories regarding her after the breakup. Basically, he started telling people she was a Tinder swindler. So yeah, that sounds like some alcoholics I've known where there's this ego thing and they can't really face what they know is the truth, that their prob personal problems were untenable for the relationship. And so, you know, the mind wants to go to these things. But when you notice that in another person, even if you think that you never do it yourself, it's always worth, like, every time you notice a big flaw in somebody else, like, ask yourself, do I have a version of that? Is there a way that I make another person bad so that I don't have to look at something within myself? And that's always a worthwhile question. And if you go to Al-Anon, you're going to have an opportunity to work with a sponsor, to work the steps, to really take a look at yourself through that fourth step moral inventory. And I can't say enough good about what I got out of doing all of that in Al-Anon. I hope you love it as much as I did. Um, so yeah, you say, feel free to go all fairy on me. <laughs> and you feel that you have a blind spot. So that's what it is. If you're in the US, do you remember the cartoon strips of Peanuts? and the character of Lucy. And she was, you know, she was just like a hard ass and she would hold the football and Charlie Brown would try to come kick the football and she'd like take it away and he'd fall down on his back, right? That's the archetype of the sister who is judging the brother. There's also a film I love with Laura Linney and Mark Ruffalo called You Can Count On Me that's also about a sister and brother where the brother is an F up and about the ways they come together and she is forced to look at her own stuff. So I'm sort of introducing all this fiction to you to show you a model of how this dynamic is, is already known in the culture. And sometimes looking at the character can help you have in gentle insight about yourself. Keep it gentle. You grew up in this trauma too. And luckily it didn't manifest as alcoholism. That's a good thing. And so if you do decide to have contact with him sometimes, you don't have to go all in. You don't have to say, okay, no contact is over. You can have short connections and you can do that by setting boundaries that are almost invisible to him or to anybody else. Did you know you can do that? I have a video, I'm gonna line it up next for everybody that teaches you how to visit family, but hold, I call them ninja boundaries, very strong boundaries that other people may not even realize you're doing it. Because when they know you're doing it, what do they do? Especially if they're narcissists, you know, they get very upset with you and they create trouble. If they don't know you're setting boundaries, you can have that like enjoyment of them and then get yourself out of there without staying for a very long time. So I've got a whole list of tips. You'll find that in a video right here and I'll see you very soon.